Good. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining another episode of Distance Learning. My name is Corey James, and I am the brand ambassador for Montalobos and Ancho Reyes at Campari. Um, as you know, Campari has been hosting these modules on Tuesdays and Thursdays for several months. Um, the talent is obviously amazing, and I'll be introducing you to my friend here momentarily. But in the meantime, please follow Campari community on Instagram for more information about what our team is up to and also the PDXCW uh, page on Facebook and Instagram for more content like this. In addition, PDXCW has compiled and archived all of the videos in the past onto their Facebook page, so you'll be able to watch those in case you have to jet out halfway through or you've missed. Um, today's module is sponsored by Wild Turkey. I am filling in for our ambassador, Joanne, today. I've got some big shoes to fill, and she is quite literally the best. Um, I'll do my best to represent Wild Turkey, but coincidentally, one of my favorite cocktails uh, and one of the first cocktails that I was introduced to when I was a baby bartender many, many, many years ago uh, was a Manhattan with Wild Turkey, and honestly, I still drink that drink today. So um, another thing I wanted to bring up is today is Jimmy Russell's 66th, 66th anniversary at Wild Turkey, and he's actually the longest tenured master distiller in the world. So congratulations, Jimmy. Um, our special guest today is a very good friend of mine uh, for many years, Camper English. Hi, Camper. How are you? Hello. Doing good. <laughs> good. Please follow Camper on uh, Instagram at uh, Alcademics. Um, Camper English is a San Francisco-based cocktail and spirits writer, speaker, competition judge, consultant, etc., etc., etc. It's just going to keep going and going and going. So <laughs> I'm quite excited for today's lesson. So, Camper, why don't you take it away, talk a little about yourself, tell us what we're doing today. Sure thing. Hi. If I'm going to see you, I'm using the glasses. If I don't need to, then they're up on top of my head. Uh, they're not really for safety. Uh, we're not going to get too <laughs> sharp and dangerous. There are ice picks involved, though, so, you know, watch at your own risk. <laughs> So hi, everybody. I, welcome to my kitchen. Um, I figure we're going to get a little wet and wild today, so it's good to have a non-porous surface <laughs> underneath me. Um, a little drippy. we got some, some ice going on that we'll talk about. Um, we're going to show do some show and tell as we go through this. Um, so by way of introduction, um, I'm a huge nerd, and I have uh, three websites. Um, so first, we'll talk about the not relevant ones. Uh, Cocktail Green is a website, cocktailgreen.org is a website for uh, sustainability uh, behind the bar meant geared towards bartenders. Uh, cocktailsafe.org is a website about safety in cocktail uh, ingredients and techniques, things like tobacco bitters and activated charcoal and homemade tonic water and the dangers associated with a lot of things. And relevant to today's talk is my main website that I've had for 15 plus years, alkademics.com. And that's where you'll find my work on ice, which goes back now more than 11 years. Um, so I've got a lot of a lot of content on there. And so we'll show a couple of them. So uh, at the top of all pages on Alkademics, you can see on, on the top menu there, there's a clear ice um, uh, link. And that takes you to this page that we're seeing the index of ice experiments on academics. And initially, over 10 years ago, when I started trying to figure out an easy way to make clear ice at home, this was like, follow along as I screw up trying to make clear ice um, over and over again. And like nine months later, I figured out a, a very simple technique. It's the, the igloo cooler technique that um, people use all over the place. and um, that was, uh, it'll be the 11th anniversary of that sort of discovery on uh, this winter. And uh, since then it's spread far and wide and I figured out a lot of other stuff to do with ice, which we're gonna talk about today. Um, one link to uh, bring your attention to is the recommended ice tool link that Leo is gonna click on. And that brings you to some of the tools that we're gonna talk about today. So if you're wondering what was that particular ice pick or thermos or tray, you can find them all there uh, linked to where you can buy them. And um, so you can have that, maybe someone could type it in the comments or just alkademic slash um, clear ice or something like that. And then you'll have that as reference. 
most of what we're going to talk about today will be referenced on the website somewhere. Um, there's just a lot of content under the ice category because it's been it's been a long, wild ride. Of that. <laughs> Lots of ice info, y'all. <laughs> Lots of it. Uh, too much, you might say. And then for you know, fun ice stuff on um, uh, Instagram is where I kind of whatever weekend dumb thing I'm doing with ice. We're going to show some pictures of some of my dumber experiments <laughs> at the end of this talk. And um, those are just all in good fun because ice is free um, to make at home and um, you can do anything you want with it. So that's how I'd like to think of it. It's sort of like arts and crafts that you can drink. <laughs> okay, so uh, today's talk, if we could pull up the outline slide, please, um, is, um, so it's tips and tricks particularly focused towards the um, towards small or medium sized bars. If you may only need one or two drinks on your menu with nice big clear ice in it, or if uh, like me, you do a lot of events where you can have some razzle dazzle with different ice uh, back when there used to be events, um, this was a lot more relevant. Hopefully they will, they will come back again. We gotta so have positive could... thinking here, Camper. Positive exactly. thinking. <laughs> and I can absolutely use that income back. Um, <laughs> so um, what we'll do is we're going to start, assuming a lot of people are familiar with how big ice manufacturing happens uh, to make cubes for bars that are sold, and also the home tricks with the cooler and other systems. But our real, what we're trying to focus on is sort of scaling the small system for those mid-size bars and events and um, displays and things. So that's our, our goal. So we'll review the systems. Um, we'll talk about the bars that are currently doing these mid-size programs and then some displays and we have plenty, well, we have kind of unlimited time for questions. Maybe we'll limit it somewhat, much, um, but uh, uh, mostly sort of at the end. Hopefully a lot of the questions you might have will get answered along the course of the talk and um, feel free to put them in the question windows that you're watching anytime. We may or may not um, ask them until the end of the talk just um, to not get too off topic. And on that note, um, we can. Uh, first, let's uh, close the PowerPoint for, for just a second as, as we um, get started. So um, when we talk about industrial size ice programs. We're talking about how people make the big, essentially two inch ice cubes at volume for bars. In the United States, I'm pretty sure there is not available for sale any machine that produces those one at a time, like our traditional ice machines. There is one, a version of a Hoshivaki machine that exists in Europe that does all kinds of cool shapes like ping pong ball shaped spheres, and uh, they do make larger cubes. But I believe my understanding is those are not energy compliant for the United States. So that's why we don't see some of those cooler machines that they have in just a few bars in Europe um, around the US, which is probably for the best, even though that ice is super cool. <laughs> so uh, we're talking about how big ice manufacturers make cubes that they will sell at volume. This can be done either by an independent uh, specialty ice provider or by large enough bars that they can buy their own sculpture block machines. So the sculpture block machine, essentially what everyone does is creates a gigantic block of ice and then cut that down into two inch cubes. So if we could go back to the slides for a second, um, you've probably all seen, this is a Kleinbell ice machine. There are some other manufacturers, but really shorthand, we just say Kleinbell when we mean giant block of ice uh, that is made. We can see there it's, two blocks that are being made at the time. There's a cold plate on the bottom. The water freezes into ice from the bottom towards the top. And there's an aquarium pump on the surface that keeps the top from freezing. And this makes uh, all a giant clear block of ice that we can see on the right side of the slide. So once we have those giant blocks of ice, then it's time to cut them into ice cubes rather than call, carve them into giant statues, which is what these machines were built for. So this whole system is, is a giant hack that everyone has been using for years to make ice for their bar program. So if we can go to the next slide. So the next step is uh, to use generally a, an electric chainsaw 
to cut the block into slabs. And you can see in the picture on the left, this is uh, Jimmy Yeager of Jimmy's in Aspen. And he, there's, this is a chainsaw with a guide on it that cuts it at a specific um, depth. So you can see the chainsaw cutting through the bottom part. I'm poking the screen as if you can see my finger. <laughs> you see the chainsaw cutting on the bottom and it's just a plate on the top to make sure it's a specific depth. And then you get a slab of ice and then you take it on the slide to your right and that is a bandsaw, which uh, is just a single saw blade that you push your slab of ice through to cut it into your two inch or whatever size cubes that you're making. And so most people who are making good quantities of large ice cubes use this system um, or something pretty similar. So you need three pieces of equipment and three steps to do it all. So it's kind of a lot for most bars to consider taking it on at home. On the other hand, um, because this is so hands-on, it can be fairly expensive depending on where you live to purchase large uh, ice cubes. Um, and these can be delivered to bars or bars might do them in-house or they might sell them to other bars is a system that we're seeing happening a lot. There is a Kleinbell machine now that makes two blocks a day that are much smaller, 25 pound, I think, blocks. So that's sort of just come to available in the past year or two. And so with those size blocks, a bar could then cut them by hand um, without the big machines. And that is um, a solution. Those, that ice machine is really expensive though, surprisingly. Um, it's almost the same price as the, the large block machines. And so one thing when we're talking about professional ice cutting, just to mention, uh, which is on the next slide, is a CNC machine, computer numerical control. What that is, is basically a drill bit on a, look what, like a 3D printer sort of rig, and it can cut in any shape you want. This was originally used by ice sculpture companies again. I always wondered like how they were able to get like fonts exactly right and everything in ice sculptures. <laughs> If they put it in the computer and the computer cuts it up, that's how they do it. Not a person. So, <laughs> yeah, not a person. You, so what we have here, what looks like some really big blocks of ice. My guess is that these blocks are going to go into an ice ball press to make ice balls later. Um, and then on the right, there are some uh, maple leaves. This is a Canadian ice company, <laughs> you might guess. Uh, and I don't know if those are votive holders or shot glasses or what. But that's how you get a lot of logo ice as well as it's a way of cutting cubes. Um, although I don't know if that's used very often to cut the two inch cubes because that's a lot of waste as you can see of the snow on that slide. So we can uh, close the slides for now, please. And um, focus on me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the industrial process of making ice. Now we'll talk about the home version of making clear ice through all the various tips and tricks, some of which I developed, and a lot of which actually readers of my website were like, oh, if you use this thermos and this ice ball mold, you can make it perfect. So credit where it's due, um, my fellow nerds of ice have uh, helped push this forward a lot. Um, and so the basic system that I first figured out, which is really just imitating how a pond freezes, is um, it's now we call it directional freezing, meaning freezing in, from one direction to another. That is simply, we take a insulated cooler, picnic cooler, fill it with water, uh, leave the top off, importantly, and stick it in the freezer. And what's happening is ice, when it first starts freezing, it forms a perfectly clear crystal lattice and it pushes trapped air and impurities away from the point of freezing. So in a typical ice cube, it's freezing from all sides because it's not insulated and it's pushing the cloudy part into the middle. Whereas in the cooler, we're pushing from the top towards the bottom. So the last like one third to 25% ish uh, can is the cloudy part. So if we're just trying to make clear ice and we don't want that cloudy part, just let it freeze for a few days in my freezer um, it's about two days for a nice thick slab or three days for a thicker one before we start the cloudy part starts forming in the back where there's so much air trap that it gets cloudy there. And that's the basic directional freezing system that we sort of then extend to all these uh, 
tricks that we're going to use to make ice at home for ice balls and other shapes. Camper, yo, you are just using your at home freezer like your regular refrigerator freezer, not like a special one. Yep, ah. there, there it is, y'all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Most of magic is made. I, I am going to show you, I did buy an additional freezer that I have in my one bedroom apartment, which is ridiculous, <laughs> um, that I that I use for um, when I'm doing events and need to make um, quantities of ice and keep more things cold. I also use it um, when I batch cocktails. I like to have my spirits super cold um, before batching so the batch doesn't warm up because I'm not going to have a chance to put it back in the freezer once it's all mixed together. So that's the little trick I use to keep those batch cocktails a little colder, like freeze all the bottles first. Nice. <laughs> so, and I'm able to do um, a lot of ice with just my, just my home freezer and my little, my extra freezer. And I'll talk more about that specifically with ice balls, which I've uh, got a cool system to do those at volume. So a question that I always get asked, so we'll just answer it now, is um, once we've made our ice in the cooler, we have essentially a slab. If it was cloudy on the bottom, you just cut that part off. It comes off really easy because it's full of air and holes and stuff. But in general, we have a, a thick slab of ice that we want to cut up into ice cubes. And um, we just do that. You can just do it with an ice pick, honestly. You score a line and then hit the line and it breaks fairly evenly. But the way to make, a lot of people are obsessed with making super clear lines for their ice. I'm a slob, I don't really care that much. But um, some tips to making nice straight ice cubes when you're cutting down a slab. Tip number one, uh, don't let your slab be super thick. Like don't let the cooler freeze all the way and then you cut off the bottom and you still have like four inches uh, thick. You're less likely for those lines to cut evenly than, um, you are if, it, if it's a three inch or two inch thick slab. A second piece of advice is to let the ice temper a long time, meaning you take it out of the freezer, it'll go from sort of clear looking in the freezer to cloudy looking while it sits on the counter to glassy and wet looking as these are getting behind me um, and very see-through and starting to actually drip. That's a good time to cut the ice. It's less likely to shatter uh, and blow shards everywhere. And you can cut it simply by basically placing any sort of straight knife on the block. Um, you can barely score a line and then just tap on it. Some people use a mallet. I use the backside of my um, hefty duty ice picks. Uh, but most of the time when I'm cutting at home and I don't care that much about straight lines, these are my two favorite uh, ice picks that I use. And that link is on the ice tools um, page that we showed earlier. These are by Uber. There are some imitators of them. I'm not sure who owns the trademark copyright on those, so uh, do as you will, but these are nice and heavy. I love this three prong sucker. This gets the job done. I use this for everything, uh, every single day. So I don't mind that they're like 45 bucks because they get a lot of use around here at academic satellite office. Okay. So so now what if we want to make a uh, real like cubes of ice at home that aren't, we're not cutting up ourselves? Well, the easy way to do that is with our cooler system, we take our a silicone ice cube tray and you can see that the, just one hole in the middle of each um, cube tray. And we can fit that on the bottom of our cooler on top of, we want to put it on top of like a little riser because there's still going to be cloudy ice in the bottom. If we fill the tray up to the level of the of the ice tray um, inside and out of the cooler, then the same directional freezing process is going to happen. But as it freezes, it's going to push the cloudy part out the hole in the bottom. And so if we just set this on top of, say, a, a plastic bottle cap from a soda bottle or something that gets it less than an inch off the surface of the bottom, there's going to be no cloudy part left in the ice cubes. And you could fill, you know, buy enough of these to fill your tray or, or make your own system. We do have a, a professional system to show off later that I think is super, super cool. And it's going to change the world a little bit um, uh, to show later when we talk about larger size processes. Now, a lot of the commercial products that 
do something similar to make clear ice. Their only function is to make clear ice cubes. This is one of my favorites as far as value goes. It's um, clearly frozen is the name of the uh, system. And it's just an ice cube tray with holes in it, uh, sitting in a reservoir that's uh, sitting in insulation, just some, some styrofoam. And I feel like this is like 25 bucks, including shipping or something. And it doesn't take up a lot of space to make 10 cubes at a time. So it's, it's a good bang for your buck. And actually for a medium sized bar program or for events, it's kind of scalable. I think you could just put a whole bunch of these next to each other or on racks with some space in between it and get pretty far with that. So that's a, that's a good system. And there are a lot of system tools now that have been developed. A lot of people really love the Wintersmith system, which is pricey, but uh, well-made from what I understand. I haven't played with one of those myself. So that is our techniques for making uh, clear ice cubes at home. We're gonna talk about ice spheres, balls um, separately. And now we're gonna talk about the in-between size ice programs, which is sort of the, the point of this talk is how bars can scale this a little bit to make more ice. Well, one way would be to be buy a lot of those, <laughs> the clearly frozen trays. Um, some bars actually do um, put a stack a bunch of these up one bar um, that I know puts just one or two of these in the, the receiver in their ice machine because it's, uh, it's a freezer and they just sort of cover the top so that the new ice doesn't fall on top of it and use that because they don't need as much ice as their machine produces. Um, but the things to keep in mind when you're planning this in-between size ice program is one, how much freezer space you have or can buy Places with a walk-in freezer where you're not fighting the chef for freezer space all the time, uh, those are ideal because with the space, we can make our own ice and it doesn't cost anything. You don't have to, once you buy the initial equipment, you don't need to purchase water. I mean, it's the cost of electricity to freeze it and the initial equipment cost, and then it's free forever. You just have to cut it up. So labor cost is another thing to consider. If labor is really uh, inexpensive or expensive, that's gonna impact your decision to cut up your own ice at the bar and spend a number of hours doing that each day. So the way some bars do this at home, um, if, particularly if they don't have room for the giant Kleinbell ice machines to make these 300 pound blocks. Some um, just have one of those 300 pound blocks delivered to them to the bar and uh, they'll come and maybe sit on a, a pallet and the bartenders will carve that up. So they'll need to purchase uh, an electric chainsaw and a bandsaw or hand ice tool. I know one bar that uses these big Japanese ice saws. They have a, a handle and like rough saw blades and they uh, cut through the ice quite fast. They're pretty efficient, but of course a lot of work. And then those can be further cut down with other saws or ice pick, the bread knife, um, as I showed. Some bars choose to avoid using power tools. Um, we do want to put a note of caution there that you know, when using a band saw, there's a possibility that things could slip. This is water, this is ice, and you want to generally not cut alone um, and um, have sort of safety measures in place. Because ice is slippery. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep all our fingers today. <laughs> um, so uh, that's uh, some people get the full 300 pound block delivered. That's that's a lot of ice, and when you cut it up, it's also going to take up a good amount of space in your freezer. So hopefully, your freezer can fit all that ice in it. That's a, a big factor. However, some other bars are just getting smaller blocks delivered to them. Those same ice manufacturers have no problem cutting those giant blocks into half size or you know, 50 pound blocks or 25 pound blocks that might sit on top of the bar as a display for the bartender to show up, hand carving ice spheres and ice cubes at the bar. And so I've seen bars of different sizes getting different size blocks delivered. And of course, there's a little bit of a price increase with the smaller the block goes. Per, per volume there, and you still have to cut it yourself. Now, uh, some bars have, rather than using the small 
sort of home individual size cooler have smartly started using, um, it's usually called the Coleman Party Stacker. <laughs> it's meant for holding, there it is, um, it's meant for holding a lot of six packs um, together. So those are not super deep. They're only like about this deep, but they're much wider than this cooler. And they make a big slab of ice all at once without wasting a ton of space. And there are different depths and sizes of these. So you want to try to find the most efficient one. And so once you wait two days from uh, making your slab of ice in these party stackers, then you can cut them up in the same techniques by hand or using just a bandsaw in this case because your slab is never going to be that deep. And um, some bars do a great job with this. There's a, an another slide um, that has a picture of, this is a bar in Brazil, I believe. And we can see in the first picture, that's a there's a slab in front and the cooler behind. And the picture on the right is the slab as it's pulled out. You can make those every couple of days and it's free forever after the, after you buy the coolers and you have enough space that so ice is so clear. <laughs> it's just, that's some good ice. <laughs> what a beaut. <laughs> I spent a lot of time just staring at ice. There's a, on Instagram, there's a hashtag clear ice fetish. I didn't even start that one. <laughs> but, but I do follow like clear ice and directional freezing. And there's even a clear ice week hashtag um, um, that someone started clear ice week. I'm in um, <laughs> so, And everyone shows off their best ice for the week. It's, that's great. The ice community is very close. <laughs> okay, so one the the thing I'm like I think is so amazing to show off is a hybrid uh, technique with a new ice tray that bartender Tony Gonzalez out of LA developed, and it's called the Ghost Ice System. And this is this is the small and not full size version of it because it's meant to fit in my little cooler, but it is essentially. It's a tray with a tray with holes in it, um, and normally this is the half size. So you can see it was was cut here. But the full size, rather than fitting into this cooler, it fits into the Coleman Party Stacker that I just mentioned. And the way it works is it actually sits rather than how I showed earlier, the tray putting it on the bottom of the cooler and sitting on the floor and filling the water only to there. This fits into the top. And then when we fill it with water, you can fill it up to the level of how deep you want your ice cubes to be. So if you filled it to the top, you'd get something like two and a half, three inch um, tall ice cubes, which are a little taller than most people would make their ice. Or if you fill it to a lesser size, you have smaller cubes. You can get some nice two inch cubes. This is an example that's been sitting out for a bit. You can see on what was the bottom, there's, um, a bit of um, an indentation there at the top that's, that's narrower. If you are an ice obsessive, uh, as many people are who just want straight lines uh, on your ice cubes only and no size that's different from each other. Corey, do you remember the miracle thaw? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, are you trying to date me right now? I think yeah. you're, you're showing my age. <laughs> I, I am, well, and mine as well. So. This is basically a miracle thaw. Yeah, it's a, it's a conducted piece of metal that they was advertised on uh, infomercials on TV in like the 1980s about <laughs> how to quickly thaw your meat at home, and it was a total scam. It's just conductive metal. Anyway, it works great for shaping your ice cubes really fast like that. <laughs> uh, that was a good one. <laughs> So that's uh, so that makes those cubes. This is a taller one um, that I made with the ghost ice system as well. But so this is I, what I showed you is sort of the half size. The full size fits in the Coleman Party Stacker, and it's probably hard to tell from the video. But this is super tough, thick um, silicone, and the full size tray is 48 cubes at a time, sitting over the Party Stacker, and that's about two days to make that ice. So if you have two, room for two of these in your freezer system at a bar, you can make 48 cubes a day by rotating them. And they pop out of the tray actually quite easy. It's one of the, the it was really smartly done. Um, and uh, it's expensive. It's about 300 bucks for the full size one. 
but pricing it out based on either 50 cents a cube or 75 cents a cube as it is in some places, it pays for itself and always less than three months, usually two months, uh, depending on the price that you're paying for cubes. So that way, no cutting is needed. Anybody um, can take the ice out, fill it with more water, put it back in the freezer, and that can be done on, on autopilot. And I really think that's a way that could help a lot of mid-sized bars and programs do this. Those Coleman party stackers do fit in certain sizes of the chest ice freezers that people have for putting their, you know, freshly shot deer meat into out, out in the garage, you know, like the grill meat uh, that goes into those. Those are probably a good size for the party stackers at home, but you want to do the measurements in advance. Or actually, if you go to the Ghost Ice Instagram or his website, which is linked from uh, the Ice Tools page, it's livingtothebrim.com. He has a really good Instagram and uh, Tony's great we're like talk about ice all the time <laughs> and um uh he could probably recommend even the size of um chest freezer that would fit the trays because he he bought ones particularly for his ice program at his bar so that is that so that's roughly our talk about our mid-size ice programs and now we're going to talk about um some fun stuff um and including brands and ice spheres and sticking objects in ice. So one thing you've probably seen are branded ice cubes with like a logo on them. And industrially, as I mentioned before, the CNC computer control drill bit thing can carve and they can get carved deeper. But you can also just go on um, Amazon or whatever and buy a letter stamp well, yeah. on my laptop now. Um, <laughs> um, just get these are it was like six dollars or something for a brass. This is for sealing letters with wax. Um, you can also get um, that's the old time stuff, guys. Just so you know. <laughs> yep. um, you can also get uh, meat brands for barbecuing that are like, you know, like on yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Androsa>. uh, <laughs> uh, You can get those, and they already come in a zillion different fonts and letters, and then you can get them custom made. And uh, there are companies that actually specialize in making them just for ice that come heated or not heated so that you don't have to like dip them into hot water to um, warm them up after you use them a couple times. And there's one company called cocktailbrandalism.com. Weird name, plenty. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so, so that's one for, for custom made. And that's a way if you're already making big two inch ice cubes to make it extra special. I find people in particular, like I'm spoiled, Corey, you're spoiled. We go to bars that have all the razzle dazzle of ice yeah. all the time. Yeah. But particularly when I do events um, or did events and will again, um, the people haven't seen the stuff because they're not the same nerds as we are and they haven't experienced uh, logo ice cubes and stuff and it blows people's minds and then you always get hired back. <laughs> I also think that that's like something that is that's like that extra little bit of touch that you can throw into a cocktail to make it. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily enhance the flavor, but you're like you're adding a little extra that people are going to be like, wow. And then and then of course your bar will get remembered even further from that. I find that when I go to smaller towns, they're like, what What are you talking about? Ice program? <laughs> right. Program. We have a machine in the back. <laughs> or the machine that's right next to the bar. Like yeah. a nightclub ice system. I'm yeah. like, ooh. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in the wrong bar right now. Yeah, <laughs> like, I hear you. <laughs> okay, so now on to uh, ice spheres, ice balls. Um, they look amazing. Everyone likes them, but they're really inconvenient to make. Um, they, the common way people make them is first you make your big clear ice block and carve it into a a big inconveniently sized block and we've probably all seen those big heavy clamp things it's uh, two pieces it's really conductive metal you put the top and the bottom and it's by pressure and conductivity alone and the ice ball comes out and it's beautiful the shape of those is great they're glossy like they really make quality ice balls but there isn't a machine available for sale that just pops those out of the machine yet so they they take a lot of effort in one way or another, even if you 
have your Klein Bell ice machine, have your ice ball press, and you still have to do that individually, uh, ice ball for ice ball. Some bars like to do the showy, you know, cutting by hand, um, as you would see in Japan and stuff. Uh, again, it takes a long time <laughs> to do that. And if you're cutting them in advance um, that way, uh, honestly, it's probably worth just getting the ice ball press and doing those in advance and um, not spending the, the labor hand carving ice balls. There are some uh, consumer versions. One that makes that, I like this as far as it's built, but it's really for the home. It's called Isology is, is the brand. And what's cool about it is I can spill it all over my floor. Um, but beyond that, it's been out for a while. Um, it comes apart super easily. And we have our ice ball. So, wow. but, but these are not the big two and a half inch ice balls that we really like. Um, they're more like this. Um, so there are some molds that make ice balls. Um, in the mold, they make the larger size. Again, these are the fancy companies like Wintersmith, and um, they take up a lot of room is the downside there. So the system that I, or really rather one of my uh, readers, um, Alcademics, figured out the ideal smallest size system to make clear ice balls is this. So we have um, an ice ball mold, uh, two and a half inch ice ball mold that you can buy Amazon or whatever um, comes apart, but it has one hole at the top. And then this is a specific thermos size called a thermos fun container. Like it contains fun <laughs> or you can put fun in there, but um, it's for kids lunches to keep like macaroni and cheese hot basically is what they are. And it has a lid initially. The way we make ice balls in these is we fill our thermos with water as well as our ice ball molds with water and we put it whole side down on top. Now with directional freezing, as it freezes clear to cloudy, it pushes the cloudiness into the cooler, into the thermos, which won't have frozen yet because it's insulated. And we get pretty nice um, ice balls out of that. Um, these are some that can often be like a little bit oblong. You can clean them up with just a, a bar rag to make them perfectly round if you want. Um, and the other advantage of making your own as rather than um, purchasing ice balls already made is that you can uh, put stuff inside of them, which is something I love to do. People love it for events and such. Um, this is a basil leaf inside of an ice ball right there. That's just another one I had. I had some basil. Um, so I, I did a couple of those in advance. But um, we can, of course, use um, the things that, that make the best decoration inside ice balls and ice cubes and ice blocks are non-porous things. So lime wheels, they can squish out some of the juice and it, the ice will look cloudy. But things like mint and basil, uh, cilantro uh, look great as well as citrus peels and you can take the peels and make knots out of them and things like that. Anything that's the garnish pretty much you can put in the ice ball. And edible flowers of course look great. Those orchids that are used on tiki drinks. Um, if you are at a bar and you want to reduce waste, one way you can do that is by any garnishes that might not say last the weekend when you're going to be closed Sunday, Monday, you could freeze those into your ice balls or ice cubes and that way they won't Oil. So that's a, a saving system, even though you're not going to eat that garnish, it's going to be locked in the, away in the ice cube. Camper, I have a question for you. If Would you say that things with more of a, um, a heavier structure that can sit inside that ice mold before it's frozen will not kind of settle at the bottom of the ice cube? Like you're not going to put one little piece of mint in there and because that's just going to sit at the bottom of the cube, correct? Like. Well, mint. Well, Ideal, the ideal thing kind of stands from side to side, okay. like a big mint leaf that might fit side to side in there and not touch much on the side. We have to be cautious of things that block the hole in the bottom. So if there was something like a, a marble, not that you would put that in your eyes, that would block the hole and then be cloudy. So we want to avoid those. That's part of the reason why these edible flowers are so good because they take up a lot of space and they might only touch barely on the bottom and uh, they're big. The 
one trick to remember for those, anything that has a lot of airspace, like flowers, you want to like give it a good shake and let that air out and put yeah. a little bit more water so that there's not air around your object there. Yeah. And cool. So, and just so everybody knows in the chat, we are going to address your questions. We haven't forgotten and we are not ignoring them, I promise. So um, I'll, I'll get to them as soon as uh, Camper has finished with his presentation. <laughs> Uh, not too much longer now. <laughs> what? So I, uh, one thing I did um, with the ghost ice tray that I just showed you, I took some wild turkey minis that I bought and made them into to ice cubes. Um, I'm thinking now with everybody doing uh, takeout cocktails and stuff, takeout booze, this would be a, a super fun way to sell. <laughs> Put these on your Instagram to let people know people are going to come and drop those on the floor. Uh, other people might just choose to take them to the park or whatever. Um, I think those are fun. And another thing that I do a lot is I um, use my cooler and then put smaller shapes in it and make custom ice that way. So, for example, I have used these before. These are food safe boxes. Uh, places like the con container store have them. And um, they do, they are um, hard plastic and so they can chip as you can see and stuff. If you use them a lot, particularly as ice expands, the bottoms tend to crack. So these are, it's not the best system, but for one-off things, you can make some super cool stuff. So one thing that I sort of proposed but have never done, uh, doing something like this, but say we had um, a digestif like Braulio um, and we put it in an ice cube a concept drink I would love to do is to put that in a Collins glass as the ice cube, but the drink around it would be an aperitif drink like an Aperol Sour or Aperol, Aperol Spritz. And so we have our aperitif at the beginning of dinner and enjoy that. And then the ice melts slowly through dinner and we have our digestif you can pull out of the glass and drink from the mini there. Like that's my concept drink free for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> If you feel free to send me a check, though, that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm writing it right now. <laughs> Using a, a larger block, I um, took a flask and made this uh, wild turkey flask. Um, this could also be fun. A lot of uh, takeout cocktails are being made in flask size 200 or 375 mil bottles. Um, and that's a fun thing there. And that's just in one of these and then and sitting in our cooler yeah. to that level. They, it's not the easiest system, but, but it's fun. But then on a larger scale, um, I've made, they have dripping away in the background. Um, <laughs> this is a uh, wild turkey bottle, obviously, um, in a big round sphere of ice. That's um, sitting for display. So when I do events and I have any kind of ice, a bottle in ice, people are like, when are you opening that particular bottle? And sometimes I'm like, that's the cheapest bottle that I'm serving, like a free whiskey bar. And I put the cheap one in the ice. Um, they're like, yeah, but I want that one. <laughs> like, and, uh, I'm like, okay. Um, yeah, so, or you say, I've already poured some out, and here I poured it just for you. And then they're like, thank you. <laughs> I'll come back when you're opening that. Um, yeah. like, ah, curses. Uh, the, the other thing to know is people at events always want to touch the ice. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a problem. So you can never serve ice that's display ice because hands are going to be all over it. And you also <laughs> want to make sure it can't easily slide off whatever you put it on. I what I have used is um, this. I, I don't know what this rack is for, but it's from the container store. And as is this, just the thing underneath it to, to hold the drips. But importantly, um, I added a, a a coaster or a napkin. This is a coaster from ABD, our favorite local local, um, and uh, to put it on it so it won't slide around on that surface particularly when people touch it as they're going to do. So that one display, the way I made this round surface was actually just with my dollar store pitcher. <laughs> um, so I put this inside of the cooler and the bottle inside the pitcher and filled it inside and out with water. 
And so initially this was much uh, thicker when it first came out than it is right now, but I let it melt a bit so it loses the cooler shape. Another way uh, that I figured out for a bar to use, they wanted to have a, um, a bar cart, a martini cart uh, that could wheel around and have bottles that were frozen, but importantly, so you could still read the brand labels on them. And the way I figured out how to do was same system as that, but using not like a buffet tray, but not the one with holes in it, like a solid one that you get from the restaurant depot or wherever. That's just how I keep my silverware at home. <laughs> but um, uh, So that inside it, and it's much smaller um, compared to the width of the bottle. So it's a little less awkward to actually pour from. And um, they were doing those in a larger cooler and just had like eight of them at a time so they could have a whole selection of frozen gins on their martini cart. They look really good. And then another one that I did. This is the big maybe, one, y'all. <laughs> maybe I'm gonna maybe I'm gonna move the laptop closer to the ice rather than drop it on my foot. Uh, <laughs> so this is uh, this is just using the entire cooler, uh, igloo cooler, and the bottle laying flatways on top of a plastic riser. So it's another one of these. Uh, boxes basically um, that and the bottle sat on top of it so I, the bottle this is still stuck in here ideally I would use something else like um like a riser that was solid it didn't fill with ice and stick inside but you could sure. potentially knock that off with something hard correct that so would that ruin the ice yeah you could um, I, ideally I would use uh, like a solid tube or something it's cool if you use something clear because then when you pull it out no one's really going to notice that you mm -hmm. pick it out the back you, another trick to do is you can suspend things on a fishing line and because that fishing line will like pull out afterwards um and not be in the ice block anymore i've done that for certain tricks and yeah, uh, kind of like similar to, similar to the question that i was asking before with like how you get things to go perfectly in the center of an of an ice cube or ball or whatever so you can use a little string just kind of hang it there yeah and i've done that hanging i carved out academics in citrus peels and then strung line through them and then sort of put that near the surface of the cooler yeah and it goes down around it and i could pull out the line and it was just the letters and the block that's uh, pretty cool. It's a lot of work, but it's pretty cool. It sounds like it, but it still, it probably looked amazing. That's cool. It, it really did. Um, so that's a way, that's, a, that's one of the easiest ways to make um, a whole bottle in an ice block for a display. One thing I wanted to mention is uh, for bars or events working with brands in particular, by featuring a bottle sitting on your display in an ice block, it draws a lot of attention to that brand. <laughs> the ice itself, but also the, the brand that's in it. And uh, people, as I mentioned before, they want that bottle and that, that brand. And so uh, for a daily special or promotion, that would be, that's a great way to bring attention to it. Good for the brand, good for the bar, sells more whiskey. So um, in addition to events, that's a great for uh, specials, way to do that. And our last section, which is just, we're gonna show some, uh, a few slides from the PowerPoint is stupid stuff. <laughs> Meaning fun projects that, that I do um, at home. This is my Instagram is a lot of this. So this is the Death Star on the left. That's just a, an ice ball mold that's shaped like the Death Star. And if you try to do that without using directional freezing, it just looks like the Death Star already exploded. It looks really uh, white and nasty in the middle, but using this on the thermos, um, we can make clear ice ball molds. So around May the 4th might be a good time to have a whole bunch of those ready for your bar for a special. On the right is just a big plastic spider, uh, not food safe. I would definitely wouldn't serve this to a customer necessarily, <laughs> but uh, made that. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a dinosaur puppet mask that I got in China. Um, and I was like, I bet these are the exact dimensions of my cooler <laughs> because I know it so well. And it was. And so I just put this mask, this plastic um, mask in the, the top of the cooler and then froze it into a block. And it looked ridiculous and awesome. So that's a fun display for the bar. Um, 
Uh, on the right is like a, just a little white plastic dollar store um, mask for Halloween. I put that on the top of a block. Again, these are more displays than edible because they're not food safe. Uh, and on our next slide, we have uh, <laughs> on the left is a pair of pink sunglasses. Those are actually sticking out the back with the, the back of the sunglasses. And I took, took pictures like spinning it around on a plate. It looked amazing. And of course, for shark, we got to show up. Um, that is that is a shark from actually a shark attack from New Orleans where we didn't get to go this year. So I, I took our shark attack uh, plastic toy and froze that. That's just standing up inside of the cooler. And I only let it froze a little bit and then pulled it out. So we have that ice, clear ice slab with a big shark through the middle of it just, just for fun. Uh, and I'm not sure if there's another slide or not. That might be the end of them. Yep. Um, and so that is the end of my talk on DIY ICE programs. I'm ready to take your questions. <laughs> Amazing. So we do have uh, a couple questions here. Um, what are your thoughts on booze infused in ice, or rather not booze, but flavored ice with fruit or things like that? So it must be a little bit more difficult to freeze with alcohol inside the ice, but like fruit. Right. So, so it, obviously alcohol is not, it's, alcohol doesn't work in general. It's going to, that part is, what you're going to do is like how they used to make Applejack in colonial America. You took just apple beer and you freeze it, the water part you scrape off and now you have higher concentrated apple booze and you keep doing that. Um, and that was a freeze distillation. But uh, uh, assuming our, our questioner knows that, um, as far as flavored ice goes, it doesn't really work in a directional freezing system because it's gonna treat anything that's not water as an impurity, like air and trapped minerals, our cranberry juice or whatever is gonna get pushed to the bottom. Even food coloring I've uh, added to the cooler and frozen and the top part of the block perfectly clear and all the food coloring got pushed down to the bottom. So it's really showing how directional freezing treats everything like an impurity that's not perfect ice. So it's best to, if we're trying to make uh, color to flavored ice to do that in an ice cube trays without the holes in the bottom uh, to do individual shapes of ice. Otherwise, it's not going to be consistently colored or flavored. Uh, we also want to avoid uh, things with sugar in it because that's going to make it slushier. Some drinks, um, bartenders do want it to turn into slush instantly. So you can have like a, a slushy ice cube you put in the drink and you pour stuff over it and it, and it melts. Uh, has that effect. But for if you just want colored ice, I've seen some people use um, bitters colored ice. It was pretty cool. We want to keep that into our smaller individual uh, ice cube shapes and, and sizes because of the way directional freezing works. Okay. So, how, what's, so this next question is, what is the best way to freeze herbs in ice balls or cubes? So I, I know what I've learned from your, your course so far is anything with some structure that will fit in there nicely, but what about like loose herbs? That's not like a thing, correct? Like those will just flow to the bottom? Bottom or the top, most likely. So um, yeah, those are not ideal. We want things that span it and are too big to just settle on one side. Yeah. So like ro rosemary, you, you know, a little sprig like that would look, look amazing. What I found, uh, dill actually looks really great, as does um, like cilantro that like takes up a lot of space. Although, you know, what the purpose of that is in a drink, I don't know. I don't want your cilantro drink, um, but uh, it's uh, <laughs> but that's how I do it. I, in just using the the tray of directional freezing. Some people, you know, you can do those in a block, and I've done um, things that float like. Um, lemons and limes at a certain point of their life. I forget if they're, when they're fresh, they sink, or when they're old, they sink, but um, just floating them on the top and then made an ice ball. And then for display, just turns that uh, slab of ice up and it's just a bunch of limes in the ice block. Looked pretty funky. Um, and that was a way to show that I was doing like mojito style drinks for that particular event. Um, so anything that sinks, we want to, keep near the surface and we do that as I mentioned before with fishing line or putting it on a riser of some sort and then in our individual ice cube trays 
they can just sit in the tray as long as you're avoiding blocking the hole. Okay. Uh, and then what shouldn't we freeze? Um, either doesn't work or a bad idea in general. When I think of this question that this person asked, I think like if you freeze something and it changes color by the time the ice is finished, you know what I mean? Like let's say you froze a piece of basil and it was bright green, but then when it was done, it was not anymore. Does that is that something that happens or is there anything well, that you can freeze? Um, I think we've mentioned most of it as far as like uh, things that are liquids that will be treated as non-water um, because those will, don't work with directional freezing very well. Anything with sugar, um, anything with alcohol. Um, I once froze a uh, bottle of non-alcoholic spirit forgetting that it was non-alcoholic and of course that shattered. <laughs> in, in the ice cream. So we want to not be stupid camper, we want to be smart camper and freeze bottles of high proof wild turkey in our ice box. Um, <laughs> and um, anything juicy, as mentioned, like a slice of lime visually can look really cool, but it can push out some of the juice. What you can do is let that slice the lime um, sort of thin and then put it in your freezer uncovered overnight. It's gonna naturally dehydrate some without looking too nasty just yet. Like hopefully it won't turn brown after just one day in the freezer. And some of the liquid will have naturally evaporated that way because the, uh, I mean the refrigerator, not the freezer, because that it's a natural dehydrator. Um, and that those slices you could put in the middle of a, an ice sphere or cube. You could do those, you know, brown dehydrated um, citrus slices that everyone loves. And uh, I think those would look bad, um, but I think they look bad to start with. I saw that coming. <laughs> but, but that's up to you. Um, and um, yeah, the colors and flavors, as I mentioned. Now it, it can be, you can just use, um, I went to a bar that had a cranberry ice ball and it was great, but they just use the regular you know, ice ball um, things without directional freezing and uh, those work good. Um, things like coconut water freezes really well. Again, not in the directional freezing system, but just regularly because it's really mostly water. And um, so it's gonna freeze solid. Uh, dashes of bitters are great um, and can flavor something. I do like to use um, colored stuff. You can use like butterfly tea, pea flower tea to have your uh, color changing effects from the ice in a drink. You've probably all seen that changing blue to pink. Um, and it, uh, usually when you're using that in a syrup, by the time you shake the cocktail and put it in the glass, it's all one color and it doesn't change anymore. However, if you freeze that color changing uh, tea into an ice ball or ice cube, the effect can happen in the glass. You can serve the glass with the ice ball and a little, your carbonated bottle of whatever, and it will turn colors as soon as you pour it yourself. And that's a nice experience for people. Okay. All right, next question. Um, this person really likes the separate ice freezer at home. Uh, they say it sounds like a good idea. Um, they just have a little apartment fridge. Do you have any suggestions um, in shopping for one for somebody maybe that lives in an apartment? I mean, I don't know how large your ice, uh, your uh, freezer, your external freezer is. Um, so oh, I, I, did I, show it? I, I meant to show it actually. <laughs> Thank you for, for this question uh, because what I, did for making sort of industrial quantities of ice ball is this is my freezer. I'm like holding this at an awkward angle. Nice for, one bedroom, for one bedroom apartment, this is stupid, um, just to be clear. Uh, but this is my industrial ice ball production facility. Um, just rows and rows. So I could make something like 30 ice balls at a time and um, using that freezer. And then once they're frozen, transfer them to my freezer for storage and uh, do that in advance of events every day. And I could get something like 250 ice balls sit between the two freezers, one for producing and one for storing. Now, this freezer, a thing to pay attention to for your uh, freezer if you're buying a separate one for the house is whether it's a chest freezer, um, so just everything sits on the bottom and stacked up or whatever, versus this one, which has racks in it. And what I didn't realize when I bought it, so I actually bought the wrong freezer, um, was the racks don't move. Um, the racks, are, it's not, um, the racks are actually cooled with the cooling coil. 
So I can't adjust the size of this. And in fact, I can't do my uh, cooler sized ice blocks in that at all. So what I do is um, that works great for the ice balls because the racks are spaced that way. Um, and it works great for storing bottles that I'm gonna freeze in it, but it doesn't work for larger objects at all. So I regret not buying something that's loadable from the top down, um, which I believe you can find that style of freezer for home. But what I would do if I had done it right the first time is <laughs> use this, my, free, my home freezer for um, the producing freezer and then the side one for storage of it, particularly the top loading ones, they're actually more energy efficient because cold air settles down. And if, when you pull open the door, the front door, like everything drops out, whereas the top loading ones, yeah. um, the cold sort of stays in. That's that's true for behind the bar as well. I learned that from Claire Sprouse actually, if uh, you keep your glassware chillers, if they, when, every time you pull them open, all the cold air drops out. That's, that's not great for if our, environmentally, it would be like the, the reach down storage ones would be better for that like the ice cream counter at the liquor store. <laughs> like those that would be great for glassware where you just slide them open. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so next question. We're having quite a bit of questions come through. This is great. Um, have you tried making concave clear ice and filling it with a float? Uh, this person says, we've had some partially frozen spheres uh, turn into empty ice balls, but they've never come out consistently. Um, if we're talking about sort of these shape things that are partially, um, well, so what the places like the aviary used to do with their drink inside the ice ball, you can use these, you can use a balloon, but, uh, these are, are better and without directional freezing, without anything else, you fill this with water, put it in your freezer for a couple hours. And so it's going to freeze on the outside, all around the outside first. Then we can take it off and carefully um, poke a hole or use a syringe and suck out the unfrozen water in the middle. And then you yeah. have a nice shell and you can put a drink back in that. And so uh, if there are challenges to that, you can let the ice get a little bit thicker so that it melts less. You also, of course, the drink that you put in it, you want to be as cold as possible so it doesn't melt through and then leak out the, out the side. I'm not sure if that's uh, if I'm answering the the question. No, I, I think that you are. I think that also it's just a matter of getting your timing perfect to have the outside frozen, but not the inside. Yeah, it's all for for all of this stuff. Uh, you can really dial in the timing. Is the the thing that takes the most time actually is the, um, to figure out how long it takes the ice is just at the level where it's all clear. It's the right thickness. The cloudy part hasn't started, so you don't have to cut it off. And uh, if you're doing it regularly at a bar, you just need to plan some time for, for that, like uh, for ice balls to sit on top of the thermos. Um, in my, both my freezers, it's 20 hours. Um, you can let it go longer, but what you don't want to do, which everyone's going to do, I've done it, is let it freeze, forget about it, and then let it, it freezes the whole thermos solid, which oh. can warp it a little bit. And then the ice balls can come out a little bit weirder, but Luckily, they haven't broken, despite how many times I've done just that thing, and um, uh, they they all work fine. It's just it's usually a, a little dimple poking out in the bottom, and yeah. that's pushed in. I think they plan for people to do this exact thing, and that's the leeway that they gave us, and I have used it up. <laughs> so um, it's it's a great idea to set a timer. The first time you do it, be conservative and be like, oh, it didn't freeze all the way. Next time. Mm -hmm. You know, two hours more, two hours more until you get it right. Uh, one thing to pay attention to is if you're doing this on any kind of scaling, having multiple coolers or systems, is how, if they're touching or how close they are to each other. Air circulation can impact not just the rate of freezing, but freezing from one side of the cooler to the other. My This freezer has a fan in it that makes the ice form like a, a lump on top of the cooler a little bit, which I can then just sort of polish away with my hand when it comes out. But it's not a flat surface that you would expect, but a little like lumpy on one side. And when we use the um, ghost ice system, um, as 
something that happens when you do this holes poked into ice um, into uh, trays like this is you get one mystery pillar, I call it, that one ice cube goes going up, 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 and you get like a six inch tall ice cube sticking out of the top. And it's just a weird thing that happens. And I'm pretty sure it's based on where the fan is hitting your ice cube to tray. That, that um, cube, the mystery pillar, always happens in one of the last cubes to freeze. Like it's usually the furthest to the side or the closest to the fan. And you just get an extra tall cube that you can use for other stuff. But it's, it's weird looking when it happens. Um, some, some of the people watching you probably experience it. And it's just like, that is weird. So everyone's like, emailed me first thing. I'm like, yep, mystery pillar. <laughs> like, I tried uh, putting like some plastic wrap over the top of the cooler, thinking that would lessen the impact of the air blowing on top of it. And it does. However, amazingly, just that slows the rate of freezing by like 50%. Like it's, it's so, it takes so much longer to freeze by having anything on the surface of that. I think the, the airflow around it wow. is actually quite important to the rate of freezing and just uh, any barrier at all really uh, slows it up. So that's something that might come up if you're trying to like stack things on top of each other in particular. Okay, um, next question. Um... I actually don't know if you've addressed this, and they say, forgive me if you've already addressed this, but why are the Kleinbell um, ice cream chains so expensive, and why do you think they've not faced more competition? Oh, that's a good question. I, uh, I And the machines that I've seen that are similar to the Kleinbell um, are even more expensive. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, and what the other ones do actually is they, for a Kleinbell, to get it, the giant block out of the machine you need basically an engine hoist that pulls the block out and then you put it on a table to cut it up and that's another piece of equipment that a lot of people forget that you're going to need and takes up a lot of space the other machines they have a door that can flap open and then you slide it just slide out the block and that's what you're paying for there essentially but that's it saves some space you don't need that hoist um why they're so expensive? I'm I'm not actually sure. I assume it's the power of the compressor, the um, and how it works with a cold plate on the bottom. But to be honest, I don't know. Um, it would seem that um, people would design ice machines more for specialty cocktails than it is happening. But um, I know one power tender did one, and then Kindle came out with basically the same thing to make like two blocks uh, at this same time that were smaller and um, some people I've looked at doing inserts into the Klein Bell essentially essentially sort of like this that fits in uh, to then you don't there's no cutting involved and to my knowledge no one has done it for the full length so that would be really cool <laughs> to see if someone uh, built a giant silicone tray out of the Klein Bell but uh, I don't I don't really know um, enough refrigeration technology just yet to uh, to speak to the pricing. Okay, uh, next question. Um, when using a brand on ice, do you need to heat it up? Um, in general, no, until you do it a couple of times. So this is the the one from Amazon, A for Alkinemics. Um, is, uh, I believe it's brass and it's just a conductive metal. So the, at least for the first few, you don't need anything, you don't need to heat it up at all. However, once it gets cold, it's less effective. So you might just wanna put it in hot water in between. And it's the same with those ice ball presses. The first one or two ice balls you make with them are like uh, really good. But uh, after that, the metal has is, is absorbed a lot of the, the coldness and there are, it's just pressure at that point and they're much slower and less efficient. So you also warm those uh, in between uh, which is kind of a pain because they're so heavy and awkward to do but um yeah it's in volume that you need to warm them up okay um and next question uh, we've got about five more just so you know um what are your favorite ice sa ice shaving knives and what type of edge is better for the shape shaving process uh, that is a question that I do not know the answer to. I don't do a whole lot of um, 
uh, shaping. Um, I see these knives being used and there's a whole website that someone just told me about and I'm not gonna remember the name of it, um, that sells uh, Japanese ice carving knives in, in particular and, and the big saws and they're really, really expensive. But um, unfortunately, I, I don't know the answer to that. It'd be the um, people who do more of the diamond carving and stuff are pretty good. Actually, uh, you might even ask uh, Tony from uh, Ghost Ice because he has old videos of him carving diamonds. So I bet he knows the answer to that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, what's the future in ice? Anything you've seen that was game changing? Also, Maxwell says hi. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Well, honestly, the, the ghost ice tray is, is the biggest game changer I've seen lately as far as uh, for use at home. Before that, uh, it was really the 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 consumer change of this industrial produced ice some ice companies trying to package ice and then have it for sale in liquor stores which had never been the case before and there are some people doing a really cool um uh, job with that um mixology ice out of uh, miami uh, and new york they do cool packaged ice and i've seen um in the Bay Area, there's a company associated with PDX Ice, but they're um, just blanking on the name because I'm trying to think of it. Um, but they have uh, big cubes and spheres that are now available at uh, better liquor stores like uh, K&L Wines, for example. And in LA, I know that they have, there's even one store has imported Japanese ice that- I've seen it here too. <laughs> You're all what? <laughs> Like, yeah, I would, of course I would buy it, but yeah. <laughs> all right. So, um, any trick to getting pebble ice or small format ice? Uh, the, so the ice, the, the ice machines, um, uh, for it, like at the bar size, they, there's just a, an ice crusher add on that a lot of ice machines have. So you have, it's producing cubes, but then it crushes it and you can get those out. Um, of course, the pebble ice, the cool pebble ice machines are um, Gossman is the ice company. And that's again at volume. I don't, I don't know if this question is for more for home uh, or not. Oh, there are all, honestly. Yeah. For, and for home, there are machines that just make pebble ice. Um, what you should Google for that is like Sonic ice home machine or something because people associate uh, Sonic burgers i don't know what they sell i've never been to a sonic but they associate that with really good pebble ice and they're machines that make ice in that size in particular and they're countertop machines that are seem fairly compact i haven't played around with those but i do know that they exist and um a lot of these uh ice machines that are countertop it took me forever to learn this they're for the pool and they're for people with boats it turns out that's that's what those machines are for i was like who needs one of these I'm like they seem a little ridiculous but they're they're for boats and pools uh, and there are ones that make that particular size of ice yeah there is one um online called opal uh nugget ice they call it nugget yes. nugget ice yeah that's it that good Thank you. Nice. <laughs> All right. So um, let's see. Um, Camper, can you please repeat the differences between ice trays with holes and without? Also, how do you go about uh, covering the holes? The they, This person doesn't quite get it. It was a little confusing for me at first, too. But then once you started explaining it a little more, I was like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. So um, when we have our holes, when we have holes in ice, that's because we want um, we want this to sit in where the clear part of our block is being made. What is happening is, um, if this sits inside our cooler, pretend this is the cooler for now, um, uh, it's sitting on the surface. So as ice freezes, it's freezing from the top towards the bottom. Because all the sides and bottom are insulated, it's freezing from the top towards the bottom. So as it freezes, it, uh, it's perfectly clear at the surface and it pushes away from the point of freezing any trapped air and impurities like minerals, but mostly air. And they'll push right out the hole in the bottom of the tray. And then the water that freezes underneath, if you let it go a long time, that's uh, the last part to freeze is where the cloudiness will end up. Mm -hmm. So it's really um, the way ice freezes. We say ice wants to be clear, form a perfect crystal. 
And in that process, it actually pushes away the air. So it pushes it down through the hole in this system. And the same with the ice ball pushes it down through the hole. And basically, once you have a hole in your tray, you have a hole in your tray. And you don't use this for standard ice since it's cloudy in another system. So basically, the water's not rolling out because you're kind of having the, the bottom of the ice tray with the hole touch the top uh, of the water. So the yeah, thanks. Thank you for that. Yeah, you always, this will always be completely full um, beneath it so it doesn't fall out. Yeah. And that's why in our thermos system, um, where the hole is in the bottom of this, we um, fill the thermos with water as well as the sphere with water and put it upside down so that now the water is going to stay in the top and it's going to push out the trapped air as it freezes below. Yeah, so yeah that's an important point. <laughs> Right. <laughs> All right. Last question. Uh, does the type of water matter? So can you use tap? Do you need to distill it, reverse osmosis, et cetera? Right. Um, it, in general, it does not matter. If you have really, really bad water, um, really um, smelly or um, Los Angeles. or something, <laughs> then, um, then maybe you want to filter it. I, to, but if we're just using the part of the ice that's in the clear part, that's a natural distillation is what's happening. And uh, that fixes the water. There's actually an old article from the 1800s about how even ponds that were really bad produce uh, drinkable quality ice cubes because of directional freezing, essentially. And uh, it clarifies and purifies. Clear ice is clean ice. It's clean water it fixes it. So if you're not drinking the cloudy part, um, you're good with just regular old tap water. The funny thing that happens is if you let your ice freeze all the way or nearly all the way in a cooler, when you dump out that block, there's this, for San Francisco water, there's this chlorine gas release that happens at the bottom because it's concentrated, all that uh, chlorinated water, that's treated like an impurity and it's pushed to the bottom of the block. So you dump out the block and you smell like you just like they added chlorine to the pool. It's really, really intense. This can also happen with um, minerals or if there are organic solids in the water, it can look really dirty at the bottom of, of your ice in the cloudy part. So generally speaking, you don't need to. Um, for small ice cube trays and such, some people have found have had problems with um, having some cloudiness and you can take off like the sink aerator that uh, screws onto your sink top that can help. You can boil the water. It makes slightly clearer ice, not really significantly and it's wasting a lot of energy and then you have to cool it down as well um, yeah. as it freezes. So that's in general, the boiled water thing is a myth, uh, but it does improve clarity a little bit because it, it releases bubbles is all that does. Um, get degasses the water a little bit and then you carefully don't get it bubbly again as you pour it into the cooler. But it's, it's really not significant compared to just directional freezing on its own. Uh, one thing to mention, if, uh, if you're making uh, clear ice in the cooler in the freezer, to watch out for is um, two things. One, if your freezer is super cold, like extreme, um, you put it all the way on the lowest setting, it's possible that your freezer is more powerful than the insulation on the cooler. And I've uh, talked to people who've had the ice sort of freezing from the outside in and bottom up on the cooler rather than just top down. It makes some clear ice, but then you have a big shell and it starts freezing in the middle. You want actually it to freeze at the warmest possible temperature it will always give you the clearest ice, whether you're using directional freezing or not. It allows for um, a slow exchange of gases and there's a natural churn of the water and it can actually fizz off. So people who have um, like dorm fridges that have a li that little freezer shelf in them, uh, making ice on those, sometimes you get incredibly clear, perfect ice without any special system. And it's just because they're so bad and inefficient that the water turns over and makes really clean, clean ice. The other uh, thing, if you're having trouble with your ice, is vibration. If all day long someone's going like, like your kids are like getting icicles out of the freezer and slamming it, every time that happens, any sort of air that's been pushed to the bottom is going to like bubble up a little bit. 
and you'll have like streams of bubbles down your eye. Showgirls, um, <laughs> streams of bubbles <laughs> down your eye. <laughs> uh, <laughs> streams of bubbles in your eye. So you want to watch vibrations, or if you have two freezers, the one that people aren't using a lot is the one to do for directional freezing if you're having trouble. Okay, um, we do have one more question, but before I do that, I wanna just um, do these end of video shout outs. So if you wanna see more uh, distance learning classes like this one, please follow Portland Cocktail Week um, on Facebook. They have new classes every single week um, on weekdays, and then they archive those classes uh, to the Facebook page. So you'll be able to kind of revisit those if you want to. Um, PDXCW is also on Instagram, so you can find out there what's coming up. Um, and then they're also posting these videos on YouTube for the folks that don't have, you cool kids that don't have Facebook. Um, <laughs> also, again, just follow Campari Community um, to find out what's happening with our team as well. And don't forget to follow Camper. I'm sure most of you that are here right now already follow him. Um, but also check out his website, www.alcademics.com. And then let's see. Last question, Camper. Are you ready? I'm ready. This is for the money, the big money. All right, do you know if anyone has tried to make a faux Klein bell with uh, like an aquarium or a water circulator or something like that? Absolutely, uh, yes, several, several people have done this. Um, they find in general, like for this small, if you're using the igloo cooler size, the pumps are generally more power than you need for those. You can get a perfect, uh, entirely clear block using that same method, what you need to do is have cut off the insulation on the bottom um, so that it will freeze from the bottom and insulate all the top and sides. Uh, the top doesn't need to be insulated because the pump is there to do that. So you can absolutely do a, a homemade Klein bell. Uh, some people are doing those in the chest freezer and uh, using a big cooler in there and um, removing the insulation off off the bottom or building something and then only insulating it on the side with an aquarium pump and and yes it works totally works um you can do that i'm sure that person's um in their kitchen trying to figure that out right now <laughs> it's, it's a project um, <laughs> I was like, one cooler is enough for me at home uh to make the ice and uh if i was at a bar situation i would probably do the party stackers now yeah. with the, that new ice tray uh, system for, for ease of use. But a lot of people really want to, you know, get in there and build it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, this, I don't think I've ever seen this many questions come through. So this has been very, very informative. I'm so glad that everyone was like so present to ask all these questions from that I didn't even think of. So this has been really great. Camper, you are the best. I'm sure you already know that. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> science. <I. laughs> well, listen, everybody, thank you um, for taking the time. I know we went a little over on our time, but uh, for those of you that sticked around, thank you for um, listening to us uh, speak about ice today. And um, if you did uh, miss anything, please feel free to um, go back to the Facebook page for PDXCW and just rewatch all the videos. Um, but other than that, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Camper. I appreciate you. And thank you, Portland Cocktail Week as well. We appreciate you. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. Thanks.